Hi folks, I'm Devok, and welcome to the Artificer's Guild, the home of all things Artifact. That was one hell of an action-packed weekend, huh? A grand total of 25 new cards, as well as the beta news we covered already. Today we're bringing you the final 9 non-hero cards from this weekend, and at the end I'm going to go and highlight my favourite non-hero cards, so stay tuned for that. To start things off, we have the Assassin's Shadow, a 7 mana black creep that's effect reads, Siege 5, and Assassin's Shadow has a minus 2 attack for each ally. This card also has 15 attack and 5 health. This, this creep looks pretty scary, right? In both the stats and the image department. 15 attack is terrifying, although we'll rarely see that amount due to its effect, and you do need a hero of that colour in the lane to be able to cast it in the first place, so at the most you're probably going to be seeing 13 attack on this card. But that isn't the true strength of this card. The power of this creep lies in its siege ability. Thunderhide pack is known as a game finishing card, thanks to its 14 attack and 6 siege, and this is another option that you can go with. It is a little squishier though, at just 5 health, but pair this with a green deck and you'll have plenty of ways to keep it alive, including Cheating Death, or one of the cards that's coming later on in this very video. With that all being said though, I think I'd still rather pick the Thunderhide, but I'm sure this card will see play in draft at least. Our next new card is the blue creep, Call the Reserves. For 6 mana, this card, that can be played in any lane, summons two melee creeps. This card is almost only a draft card for sure, outside of maybe some meme decks. Six mana is just too hotly contested, and while it isn't cross lane, you can get just so much more value out of Dimensional Portal. I know there is one meme lord out there who has built a deck around the Ogre Corpse Tosser, in which case cards like this, and better late than never, can provide suitable cannon fodder for your tossers, but even in that extreme case, you're still getting much more value out of Dimensional Portal. Also, is it just me, or do these dire creeps look an extra bit more dire than usual? They seem to be in the heart of the dire lands by the look of those trees, but they look a little extra malicious. Just some dude for thought lore wise. Now, I hope you're ready for this next card the Klasmir Hourglass. It's a 10 gold item in the trinket slot, which grants the equipped hero plus 4 health. Then, whenever an opponent draws a card, give that card plus 1 lock if the equipped hero of this card is in any lane. This is probably my favourite item that we know of so far anyway. I'm a big fan of mildly annoying mechanics in games. I like to be able to play mind games on my opponent without making them feel so bad that they want to quit the game entirely. And to me, this card just fits that build perfectly. Not only that, but it actually looks pretty decent too. As you're going to the later stages of the game, there'll be a desperate fight for resources. Both sides have used some of their biggest drops, and it hasn't quite decided the match. And with this hourglass, you can ensure your enemy is one entire round of resources behind you. This can also be added to our growing list of cards for a lock deck, and we can maybe start to think about how we would build one. You obviously need blue because they have all of the lock spells, but now it seems we need a solid way of farming 30 gold for three of these hourglasses. So perhaps black? Let me know which two color combo you would use for a lock deck in the comments below. Our next card is Curse of Atrophy, a six mana green spell that modifies enemy heroes with minus two attack. We saw Crippling Blow last week and honestly I wasn't particularly wowed by it, Curse of Atrophy will affect an entire lane of heroes, but at best you're hoping to hit 3, and while that is pretty good, by the 6 mana round those heroes have already got the most value out of their attack, and are likely even buffed up by now. On top of that, imagine playing this into blue. They couldn't care less about their hero's attack value at mana 6, because they just want to eclipse or annihilate you anyway. However, as with most of these quote unquote bad cards, there will likely be a spot for them somewhere. We've seen at least 4 or 5 of these cards now, that involve removing enemies attack. Is there a deck out there based around that? Well, probably. Next up is the Trebuchet Mark II, our Horde Catapult. For 2 mana this black creep deals 2 piercing damage to the enemy tower before the action phase, and has 0 attack and 4 health. So instead of a 1 mana improvement that you can actually place in any lane and is very difficult to clear, you have a 0 attack creep with 4 health that will do the same. Honestly, I don't see much space for this card. Even if you did build a Siege Engine type deck around Trebs, Solar Khan, and the Horde Catapult, I honestly think there are better cards to swing fast, one of which even made their way into my top 4 cards that we'll see later on. I'm always glad this is an uncommon card too, it means that we won't be seeing it as often in drafts. That's one fewer useless card for me to be picking up I'm afraid. Now in Dota we have affectionately named the Hellbear Creeps. You've already met the Tomato, and here is the child of said Tomato, the Potato. The Rampaging Hellbear is a 4 mana green creep with 2 attack and 3 health, and the ability that modifies Rampaging Hellbear with plus 4 attack after the combat phase. So this is 
basically a very, very risky version of, say, to-do list. And I actually like this. It is green after all, so you have plenty of access to damage immunity and regeneration, not to mention silence now Drow's signature card has been revealed. You definitely have the tools to keep this beast alive. However, in Constructed, I feel like there are just too many control options. Pickoff will literally complete its namesake, and from a different lane will one-shot the poor potato. And Slay will go straight through your damage immunity, should you use it on him. However, a potentially lethal card to have in a draft deck. Next up, we have Self-Sabotage, a 4-mana blue spell that modifies two random cards in your opponent's hand with Pulse, deal 6 damage to a random allied tower in any lane. Another mind game card. Oh, I can't wait to watch my opponent decide whether or not to take the 6 damage hit or to just play a Foresight or some other utility card, only for that 6 damage to be their complete undoing. However, unlike Klasmir Hourglass, I think this mind game card isn't actually that good though. You are spending 4 mana as a blue player to possibly deal 12 damage over 2 instances to random enemy towers, when blue cards in general are just so hotly contested and the 4 mana slot is very hotly contested. As a part of a meme deck again, yeah I can see this being used, but you can't even use this in a lock deck, as lock would stop them from using the cards that would be dealing damage to their towers. It's a bit of a shame as I do love the mind games, but not every card I like should be strong because I'm inherently an annoying player. Our penultimate new card is Soul of Spring, a 4 mana green spell that modifies a hero with, after you play a green card, give this hero and its allied neighbours plus 4 regeneration this round. Now, this card, like many others of its type, will trigger off of itself, so you'll at least immediately get that first effect. And this is the card I was talking about earlier, the epitome of what green can do as far as keeping stuff alive goes. You get 4 regeneration. Nothing will ever die in combat. That being said, this might be a little overkill. The reason Enchantress seems so strong is because just like 4 attack is the critical point of offence, 2 armour, or 2 regen, is the critical point of defence, as that is what the enemy melee creeps will offer as damage. So the extra 2 regeneration will only really be of use against summoned creeps and or weaker heroes, but that still makes for one hell of a tough lane. The only issue we'll find with running this though, is that what are you going to do with that tough lane? Green does have some options for buffing the attack of units, but if you haven't dropped an early Mist of Avernus, or there wasn't space in your deck for an act of defiance, how do you actually plan to kill the enemy tower with your two unkillable melee creeps? And on that note, we move to the final new card of this week. This time I say perhaps the best card to last, even if I am fangirling all over the hourglass. The Stonehall Elite is a 4 mana red creep, with 4 attack, 2 armour, and 2 health, and an ability that states modify Stonehall Elite with plus 2 attack and plus 2 health after the unit blocking it dies. So with the exact same stats as a Bronze Legionnaire, you might wonder why this card is worth an extra 2 mana. Well, the reason Bronze Legionnaires are so good is because they rarely ever die, so they offer potentially unlimited value. But that is why this card goes the extra mile. Not only does it have the potential for unlimited value, killing off enemy melee creeps without dying, but every time he does, he gets stronger. So now he can kill summoned creeps, like an Eglody Vandal without dying. And after killing that, he can one-shot a Luna without dying. I think you're beginning to understand what I'm getting at here. A common term in gaming is snowballing, where you get a lead and it becomes bigger and bigger as the snowball rolls down the hill. Well, the Stonehall Elite is the snowballiest snowball that has ever snowballed. So those were all of the new cards from this weekend. If you didn't catch the other half, be sure to go back and watch the video detailing the delay of the beta, because we also cover the other half of the new cards there. With those done, and us now only one hero and three or four new cards away from a full set, I wanted to take a look back at my favourite card from each colour, that isn't a hero or signature card. Now, once we have all of the cards fully revealed, I'll do a list of the top cards in terms of power, but this is purely a glance back at all of the reveals and leaks and packs content, and discussing why each of these are my favourite cards. Starting with red, there can only really be one. The reveal that started all of this off. My reveal. The Legion Standard Bearer. The Legion Standard Bearer, if you didn't catch the original video, is a 4 mana red creep with 0 attack, 0 armor and 6 health, and Legion Standard Bearer's allied neighbors have plus 4 attack. When Valve approached me to reveal this card, I felt a whole swirl of emotions. It was humbling, but also incredibly rewarding, after all the hard work of putting out consistent content and helping build the fantastic community you're all a part of, we were finally graced with the ability to reveal something no one outside the beta had ever seen. So let me quickly take this opportunity to thank you all, for without your fantastic support, that reveal would never have happened. Okay, enough with the soppy stuff, on to the memes. Because this card wasn't just a first for us, but it also started the glory 
That was Goat Week. The Play Artifact Twitter account's first foray into being a fantastic community engagement tool. Since then, we've had puns galore, as well as the occasional throwing of shade at other card games out there. For green, there's really only one option for me. The Mists of Avernus, a 3 mana green improvement that modifies all allies with plus one attack before the action phase. So this might actually end up in our list of the best cards once we have the full set, but I simply can't stop looking at this card and seeing how awesome it is. Drow Ranger has just been revealed with a global passive that increases allies attack by one, and the community is going nuts over how strong it is, and rightly so, that does sound pretty strong. Now imagine Drow's passive was reduced to one lane, however it gave your allies plus one extra attack every single round, and that was a modification, so it stayed forever. Well, that's exactly what Miss of Avernus is. This card looks fantastic, and I can't wait to make a green deck full of friendly Vol Rebels, buffing up Papa Samet so he can destroy Stonehall Elites. Black is up next, and I alluded to this card earlier. The 4 mana spell, Murder Plot. Give a black hero plus 8 attack this round, and choose a combat target for it. You might look at this card and think, so what? Plus 8 attack for 1 round? You use it to help you kill a threat, sounds decent, but why is Divock got it as his favourite black card so far? Well, how about we look at some of Black's mobility? Winter Wyvern can move to an empty combat slot. Ball Lightning, Storm Spirit's signature card, can let you do the very same thing. So you can carefully place heroes to make sure they're hitting a tower. Your enemy thought they were safe. 20 health on their tower is plenty. All they need to do is survive your onslaught on his first lane, and they can end the game in the second lane. So, you Ball Lightning your Sola Khan so that she's hitting the enemy tower for a massive 12 damage. You're still 8 damage short, the enemy thinks they have 1 because a card that grants you 8 damage in such a highly mobile deck would be OP, right? And that is why I love this card. Our final card in the list of favourites is for blue, the 10 mana blue spell, Bolt of Damocles. Simply deal 20 damage to the enemy tower. Now why do I love this card so much? That's a 10 mana card, you'll rarely ever get to play it, and even if you do, the enemy tower won't have 20 health left, it'll be more like 5 by that late stage of the game. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't have some deep meaningful reason as to why I like this. I don't have some metaphor that ties this card into the way I live life, and that it epitomises my personality and for me not to pick it would be slanderous. I picked this for the style points. Nothing says I definitely beat you, like 20 damage directly to your enemy's tower. And that just about sums up our list for today. As always, thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed the content, feel free to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out. I've been Divok of the Artificers Guild, and I will see you next time.